Ok. Hello again. We were talking about how to find a solution. We have a set of tasks which shall be executed and a set of processors which are, uh, can execute tasks. And then we find a distribution of this task in these processors and there shall be a solution how to allocate resources to tasks. Okay, um, we saw that's not so simple. We have not a clear algorithm how to find a solution. We try, make a simulation, and then try again, make a simulation again, and try many uh, different solutions and select the best solution. This is the way how, it's, uh, how it works. So it's not really optimal because it's a really complex problem. There is no way at the moment how to find uh, directly the best solution. And now we have one more complications. In these solutions, we found a distribution. This task shall be in this node, and this task shall be in this node, and these are the communication links. And it's fixed. But now, maybe it is not fixed. Maybe we have the chance or the opportunity in runtime while executing to move one task to another task. For example, we make this schedule, this program, and we see this node is doing nothing and this node is doing too much. So after the distribution is done, we take the decision, let's move this task to this node and then execute it there. And even worse, maybe we began already with the execution of this task and inside of the execution we see, let's move this task, including context to other tasks. So what it is done, it's already done, but it shall continue in other computing nodes. And this makes everything much more complex. So if we have migrations to move tasks from one node to other node, we have two uh, options. First, move only applications which have not been started. So we have no context to transmit. Or even worse, move applications which are already running. And we call this, that is a type of preemption. Uh, talking about uh, distributed real-time systems, we have the preemption. If a task can be uh, suspended, another task will be executed, and then we can continue with the same task. And then we have the next step of preemption. The task will be interrupted, it will be transferred to other node, and it will be restarted and continue working, but in other node. To do that, we have to transfer the whole context, the whole memory of the task, and this may be a very big effort, communication effort and time effort. So this migration with preemption is not so simple. Okay, now let's talk about me. <coughs> migration of task with reallocation. A pre-allocation is what we have uh, before. We have an instance of task uh, which might run, run in many processors. But a started job is not allowed to migrate to a, another processor. What I said before, we can migrate only applications which are not running at the moment. So we have a first distribution of nodes and we think in runtime, we have a better distribution. And before we start with the execution of one application, we move to other node and then it will be started on another node. This is difficult, but not so difficult. Really difficult is with preemption, I said before. This is what we call a task level migration and allows a task to run to an any processor at any time. And then please warning. The task migration it has a very high cost in this time with preemption because it was already started, it's already running, and then we have to transfer the whole context, all memory, all register, all variables, everything which this task is using to the other node. Uh, this could be a big problem if this application is using some input output devices and these input the output devices are attached to one processor. And then we move to other processor and the input output devices are not there anymore or other different input output devices. So this is a, a big problem. But if we ignore this with the input output, then we have to transfer only memory context, all register and the world context. And this is not, to, not used to send a message with the a few values, we have to take a snapshot of the memory of this task and send to the other node. And this can be very, very big and it can take very, very long time. Well, there is an exception. If we have a multiprocessor, multi-core with shared memory, then 
we don't have to transfer anything. Everything is in the same memory. So use moving from one processor to the other processor, but they have the same memory. It's just suspending a task like preemption and reactivating the task in the other node. This is a simple solution, but uh, not the normal solution for distributed systems. Okay, now let's talk about migration of task. There are, in if there is, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> if there is no shared memory, then it's difficult. Okay, it has a high cost and high bandwidth. We have to transfer a lot of data. We have to transfer the whole environment and all local resources from one node to other node. And then consider the time in scheduling. Migration is to start a task, move the task, and execute in, in, in the new in the new in the new uh, processor. We can say, okay, this migrator, which is going to take a task and transfer to other, is a task by itself. It's not a part of the scheduler, it's not a part of the operating system, it's a task, it's a complex uh, task which takes a snapshot of other task and transfer to other node. On the other node, we have to ha have the opposite side of this migrator, the one who is going to take everything, allocate in the local memory and transfer the CPU time, the, 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 the control to, to this other task. Okay, and then we have to schedule this other new task, which is the migrator on both nodes. We have to schedule two migrators. Okay. And when shall we do that? It's very effort consuming, high effort. And maybe we have to do that only if we have very high priority task which we say, okay, I have something which has to be done very urgent in this node. So this task shall better continue in other node. And this task cannot wait so long until the high priority task conclude. Then I have to move it to somewhere else where uh, the is not so loaded or we don't have such a high priority task which shall be executed in the other node. Or maybe it's waiting for resources and it's waiting too long. Let's move to, to other node. Or waiting for a timing which is very far away in the future. Then let's move to other node and then it can take a long time or waiting for synchronization, semaphore or something like this. Um, and said before, we have the two options. This is with preemption. And the most simple thing is to move only action, a task which has not been started now, which are, has not been already dispatched. So in these cases, the cost is lower and the migration is much more simple. Uh, now we have maybe another problem. If we have to transfer the code, the execution code, the program code from one computer to other computer, then it's a big effort. But the best solution is if every computer has already a copy of this execution code, but it is not activated. So any computer can activate or execute any node because uh, any application because it has already all applications in its uh, uh, memory but they are not activated. The only thing they have to do is activate the tasks. That's, that makes everything much more simpler, but consumes a lot of memory because every node has to have all applications. Okay, now we have the situation of load balancing. Maybe we have a very big powerful computer and this very powerful computer is doing almost nothing. And then they have maybe a very small computer and this small computer has a lot of jobs which shall be executed and sh some of then requires a lot of effort. And maybe we have another computer which is not as big as this, uh, not as small, and it has only one job. So we can see this is not an optimal distribution. Then we shall consider about migration of these nodes, jobs. Maybe they have not been activated now, or maybe they are already running. Then we have to have a preemption to the computers which are doing nothing, or which has a lot of much more idle time. Okay, that is the load balancing. How to take this decision, what to migrate where? Okay, how to determine the load and one not and the real-time system? Okay, we say this has nothing to do and this has a lot of things to do. But how can we measure this? There are different ways how to measure. Maybe do you remember we have this state diagram for applications. We have here a list of all applications which are ready 
and only one will get the CPU that will be executed and then it will be suspended, it comes back to this ready list and we take the next one. Okay, one way to, to see, to measure the, the load balancing, the, the load of one node is see how many applications are ready. Maybe it has many, many applications, but they are not ready. They are maybe waiting for some time in the future or maybe, maybe waiting for your input output, so they are not a lot for the system. A lot for the system are only the applications who need the CPU, the CPU time now. They are waiting and waiting. So one way is to measure how many applications are ready in every node. And then we can count here we have three ready applications, here there is no one and here only one. Then we can estimate this has a lot of three, a lot of one and a lot of zero. But we can do it a little bit better. Not only the number of applications, maybe some applications are going to be very short, just add a value and ready. And other applications will perform very complex operations. So maybe here we have only one job, but this job is really, really heavy and has a very high priority. So we cannot say this computer has a low load, only because it has one node. So a little bit more complex is not only the number of applications which are ready or tasks which are ready, but how heavy each of them are, how much uh, time con uh, 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 how time consuming these are. Okay, uh, the next thing is not to look at the number of applications or how much computations, but we are in a real time system. Take a look to the net next deadline. If we have many deadlines which are very close to each other and very close in the future, then we can say this node has a problem. It has a very high load. Maybe this has a lot of applications, but the deadlines are very, very far in the future. So we can say, okay, this computer can get much more other applications who have <coughs> a deadline who, which is not so far away. So this will be another way to measure the load. Or another way is just to count the idle time. A, when we have tasks which are ready, we are executing uh, using the CPU time for this task, and if the CPU is doing nothing, or uh, we don't have any task which is ready, then we can just count and counter in idle time, the time which the CPU is doing nothing. And then we can compare this counter of different computers and then see how much time was each computer doing nothing, just waiting. And the one with the highest number has the lowest load. And this computer could have more, more tasks. But that's not a very good measurement. I think the best measurement is the deadlines in the future and the number and task taking into account how uh, the, how heavy are the computations of each of these tasks. Okay, and now I would like to show an example how we are doing this. An example from an institute, from Aerospace Information Technology, and this example is this Project Vidana. This is what we did. Okay, we have different nodes. In this example, we have three nodes. As I said before, we have the option if each node shall have a copy of every application which can be executed. So we need a lot of memory, but not all these applications will be active. They are ready to be activated, ready to be executed, but they are, most of them are doing nothing, but they are consuming memory. If not, then maybe we have only a subset of tasks which are already allocated in this node, and this node can execute only these tasks. Or the much more complex way, the code, the execution code, can be transmitted from one computer to other computer. So when we are migrating the task, we are sending the execution code to. But that is much more difficult. So let's consider the most simple and most efficient way. Every node has all applications already installed and they are ready to run, but they are not running. Then we have a task distributor. And this task distributor tells each class work or don't work. So be activated or be not activated. And then let's say we have four tasks and we can take a distribution. In this node, we are going to execute only application one, in this only application two, and in this application three and application four. 
And this is how it will be executed. And it, we see, okay, this application for shall be executed somewhere else. It sends only the signal stop working and it sends the signal start working. And then we have migrated this to here. But not so simple. We have just started, but to migrate from here to here, do you remember, we have to send the context. So all variables on all memory from here has to be transmitted to here. What we did is we have a class and in this class we keep the content context of each application. So we don't need to send the whole memory and memory snapshot of every application, but we know what is important to be able to continue with this application in other node. And this is an, a structure, a data structure. And we try to keep it as small as possible with the parts which shall be transmitted to be to continue the execution in, in other node. For example, if one shall count number of stars. It's counting one, two, three, four, five. The only thing we need in this context is which part of the sky he has already counted and this counter. And then he sends this. I am counting until this angle and I have counting up to now one million stars. Continue. And then we continue one million and one, one million and two, and we continue scanning the sky in, let's say, only one dimension. So this will be only two values, an angle where we have look at and the number of stars up to now and then we transmit the context to the other node and in the other node we are we can activate this application this application might continue working okay uh, and uh, remember all tasks are replicated and my room anywhere and something important maybe we can re uh, start several applications in several nodes for example if we want to implement fault tolerance. One application is very important, and if the node crashes, for example, application two is really, really important, and it, it, it crashes, we have a very big problem. So we can ex start the application two, two times, one here and one in this node. And if one of these nodes crashes, then we have still one uh, instance of application two running, and then we have no crash. We can start every application two, three, four times according to the requirements of uh, reliability or their dependability for this function. Okay, another thing we have to consider is each node, this task distribution collects information about the node, for example, the load to implement something like load balancing. So the task distribution not only tells each task when it shall be activated, it knows the load of his local uh, task and uh, of his local node, of his local computer, and sends this information to all other task distribution. So every task distribution can compare his own load with the load of other nodes, and then it can take the decision. Actually, this task shall better run in other node because the other has a lower, lower uh, load than my local node. Okay, <clears throat> and how it works? Uh, let's take a very simple case, only two nodes. And let's see only the task distribution and let's see only one application. Actually, we have many of them, but let's say the more simple case. We have task one, task one is here and is here, and we have these two task distributor. One is active, he has the control, and the other is passive. He's only ready to work in case if this fails. If this doesn't fail, as long as this is working, then it is going to distribute all tasks in all systems. It will take the decision which tasks shall be activated in which node. So we have a global view and we take global decisions. And therefore, this is the best we can do for the, uh, for the optimal schedule of task. So uh, we have here different topics. Do you remember about when we were talking about uh, middleware? with publish subscriber. So the task distribution will send the task infos and the task infos will come to all other task uh, distributors. So all task distributor will be synchronized. It takes the decision which task shall be executed where. It executes this decision and forward these decisions to all other task distributor. The passive task distributor does not take any decision. It they keep only updating its uh, databases to be consistent 
with the master one, with the one which is working. Then it forwards node information. For example, the load, how many tasks are working in each node, and the local node of this, of this uh, node. So all other nodes can know which is more loaded and less uh, uh, loaded. And then it can forward task commands. For example, task number one, start working it node number two. Or as task number one, stop working it node number one. These are the commands to activate and deactivate tasks in different nodes. And then we have the context. I said before, when we migrate one task from one node to other node, we have to take its internal context from this node and in, in install somewhere else. For example, this is the active task in this node. This is the passive task. It's doing nothing. So it's doing some computations. And after concluding each computation cycle, it will forward its context to the passive task. So in case this shall be interrupted or this shall continue, then it is consistent. It has all information it needs to continue uh, the computations from the same point. So the context will be transmitted periodically. It's maybe a very big overhead. Therefore, we have to take care this, this context shall be very, very small. And then we have a very important thing. I'm alive. And I'm alive says each node is still working. So each node shall send periodically, maybe once per second, the signal I'm working, I'm working, I'm alive. And if this task distributor who takes control sees this node is not responding anymore, then it can assume all these tasks which are in this node had crashed. So we have to distribute this task to other nodes and this node shall be reactivated. Exactly the same with this. This node is sending I'm alive too. And if other nodes realize this node is not working anymore, then they are going to take control. So how it works? Uh, the task distribution must cover the following aspects. In case of a crash, for example, this node crashes and this one has the control. Sorry, and one second. The affected task must be migrated to a non-affected node. So one node crashes, then all tasks which were running there will be suspended. Of course, the node is not working and they will be activated in other nodes. Uh, the node load must be balanced. So when distributing the, the crashes, the task from the crashes node, the task distributor shall look which nodes had the lower uh, load. And then let's say we have to distribute three tasks. We take the first one, select the node with the lowest load, and we send the first task there. And then we increment the load of this task. And then we see again which has now the lowest load, and then we forward the next task to the next node, and so on and so on until we have redistributed all tasks again. Okay, now the task context will be distributed. This is not the task of the task distributor. Every task will forward its context periodically to, to all other replicas. <coughs> <coughs> okay. And down, only one task distribution is active and at any time. As we say, that is the active, he is taking the decisions, and all other, look at this. Every node has its own task distributor, but only one is active. All other are passive. They are only getting the data and keeping its information synchronized. Okay, and it shall be possible to run more than one task at the same time in multiple nodes. What I said before, in case of fault tolerance, we want to be sure if one node crashes, there is some functionality which we shall not lose. It shall continue in other nodes. Therefore, these applications can be replicated. And maybe we can have something like a voter. Um, okay, on the decisions which task is running and how many replicas, this is taken from outside. So those are the a parameter to the to the task distributor from outside. We say task number try shall be executed four times, and then it shall take the decision which node shall execute this task for different nodes for this task. Okay, and this is how it works. It's a PetriNet diagram. If you want another lesson, I can present how PetriNet works, but uh, it's a simple principle. So 
at the moment uh, I think it's understandable. So we have two uh, task distributor, one is active and the other is passive. One is working, Arbeiten, <laughs> it is working. And in every time cycle, it will take a snapshot of its internal structure of which tasks are uh, running where, and then it will distribute to the network. So we go to the message distribution on the network, we come in other nodes with the passive task distribution, and they synchronize their context. So they stay in this loop, synchronizing their context. And this stays in this loop. Distribute and come back here. Distribute and come back here. Only if we have a time out. For example, we don't get data from this node anymore. So we are synchronizing, synchronizing, but then we have a time out. So we are going to cross this transition and then it will be begin working after this has crashed. And then this will take control and will do the same work, take a snapshot of its content, distribute and continue working. And then we distribute the message and the all, all other will keep in this loop synchronizing its context. Okay. And now how, how it works in real time. Okay. Let's take a look to the task, <coughs> task distribution. Remember, there is a copy of each task in each node. And each of these tasks can consider to be active, it is running or passive, standby, just waiting. But it keeps your context uh, synchronized with the master uh, task. And there is a copy of the task distributor in each node. So each node had all tasks and including the task distribution. And this is a global distributor scheduler. So it distributes, it knows the state of all nodes, it knows the state of all tasks, and it takes the decision which tasks shall be executed where. Uh, and only one of these shall be active. So as you can see here, one is active, is controlling, all other are passive, they are just synchronizing their content, their, their state. Okay, and how it works? The a task distribution keeps tracks, tracks of all nodes and all tasks in the systems. It knows what shall be executing and it knows the load of each node. And it reports to all other task distributors, so they will be keep synchronized. Okay, it knows which node exists in the network, which nodes are still working and which node has failed, which nodes are active and what is the CPU load of each node. And from the side of the task, it knows which task exists in the system, which task is active or shall be active, and where is it active, and how many replicas belong to each active task in case of fault tolerance, and which node is running which replica of each task. Okay, and this is what he knows, and this is what he, it is going to distribute. And now let's assume we have a failure, a node failure. A simple case, let's say we have these two computer and computer B fails. Here we have the task one was active, but the task distributor here was not active. The simple case, node B fails, but the it's not running the active task distributor. Uh, it stops sending this I'm alive message because it has crashed. And then the active uh, task distributor will see if this node is not responding anymore. Then it will deactivate this task and reactivate the task in other nodes in the node with the lowest uh, load. This is the simple case. This is something which I mentioned before. And now a little bit more complex case. Node A is going to fail. And node A is the node with the active task distributor. Okay, then the sequence of actions. Node A fails and it's running the active task distributor. Then one of the passive task distributor becomes active. He will see, I am not getting messages from the uh, hub task distributor anymore, so it will take control. Like, do you remember this PetriNet diagram? As long as it was getting the context messages 
from the active time uh, uh, task distributor, it was just synchronizing its context, doing nothing, just synchronizing. But if this doesn't come anymore, then we have a time out, and then it begins working, and then it will take control. Work, snapshot, and distribute. And then we have to take the decision which shall be activated. So we can have many of these task distributors. This has failed, and in this case, we have two other, which shall be activated. And everyone has all information of other. One of these information is the running time of each node. So we note for each node how long it has been working and what is its load. And we can assume the node who has been working for the longest time is the one who is most reliable. It has been working for a very long time, so we assume it will continue working for a long time. The one who has been just restarted, we know this node has something not very good, so it, it was just restarted, maybe it will crash again. So to take the decision which task distributor shall take control, we look to the oldest node, to the node which is working for longer time, and this one is going to be the new master, the new active task distributor. Okay, then we have a new task distributor, and then we have to distribute the task of the final nodes, and then we perform like in the simple case. We have the list of tasks which shall be running. We see these are not running anymore. And then according to, to the load of the other nodes, we are going to distribute the task. And then we have the situation, maybe the crashed node will perform a recovery, will be ready again. Maybe this was crashed. All task was distributed to other nodes, and then it becomes ready again. And it begins sending, I'm alive, and sending a report I have a load of zero. I'm doing nothing. Then the task distributor will see, okay, some other are maybe overloaded, and then it will distribute some task to migrate to the new restarted node. And so is how it works. Uh, just a second. Okay. Up to now, we were talking a lot about scheduling. You say there is a scheduler and it takes decisions and it will distribute tasks. But we said nothing how to distribute the tasks. So let's begin looking how this distributed scheduler shall work. For the beginning, there is no migration. Okay, how it works. We have two possibilities. We have a global scheduler and we distribute the task on the fly. So we have different processes and we have a list of all tasks which shall be activated. And remember, we are handling this case which all processors are homogen and all tasks can be executed on all processors. If there are some tasks which can must be executed in a special processor, so they are not going to be listed here. They are allocated to this processor and there is no degree of freedom. But let's assume we have these tasks T3, 4, 5, and so on, and they can be executed on any processors. They are just computations. Okay, the most simple thing is we have a global scheduler, and this global scheduler knows which processor is working and which processor is not working at the moment. And something important, I am saying working and not about loading, just working or not working, doing a execution a task or not. If one processor is doing nothing, then it will take the next task and forward to this processor. Okay, and then one other processor will conclude a task, then this task will be removed from here and it gets the message, I am ready, I can get another task. Then the global scheduler will take a look to all tasks which shall be activated and send the next one. So the processors, they don't have a local scheduler, they get only one, execute this, now execute this and now execute this. So here we have a global view and we can take global decisions. For example, the sequence of uh, threads which shall be activated. We have another, we have a pre-allocation. And in this pre-allocation, we have different processors and each processor has its own schedule. So when a new task is coming, then scheduler is going just to take a look of the load of each of these processors and say, if you have time, please execute this. 
And then each processor will have its own list of applications which shall be executed. And then each processor has its own local scheduler and it will take the decision how to execute this. Like a normal single processor, with the, which we saw before, he has this list of applications and they will be executed as good as possible. So this is a pre-allocation. So the global scheduler makes only an allocation which applications shall be executed in each node. And in this case, we have no dynamic. They are fixed. After this distribution, this task will stay here. We have no migration. They are allocated and they stay there until the end, until they conclude and they, they can get uh, new applications. Uh, and something, each node, each computer shall be able to execute any task. And the target, the parties to partition M tasks in n nodes, and each node have sharp and isolated scheduler. And <laughs> I said before, to take the decision how to distribute these nodes, we can just use, use the load of each of these nodes to, to see where to distribute it next. And this load can be uh, computed, I said before, four different ways. The number of ready tasks, the, the, how heavy each task is, or the deadlines. How far away are the deadlines in, in the future? Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay, then let's see different approaches how to distribute the tasks, which tasks shall be allocated to each node. Uh, we have the so called bin pecking algorithms, and we have three options in this case. At the end, we are going to consider only two, but, but at the beginning, let's consider these three options. We have the first fit. Each application will be uh, in, uh, activated or distributed to any computer which has no resources to execute this application. So the first <coughs> node will get many of them. This will have a very high, high load. Then best fit. The being with the smallest capacity that can accommodate the item will be allocated. So we see the one who, who, who has the lowest uh, free space, and if the new task fits there, then we are going to allocate the new task there. And worst case fit, maybe this is the best, this the bin with the maximal capacity that can accommodate the item, of course it has, shall be able to accommodate the item, will get the item. But I think the best way is to demonstrate this with an example. Let's assume this is from, this is the load, number 1.0 is the maximal load. The, 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 the computer is total overloaded. 0 0.3 is, we have a load of one third of the capacity of this computer. Okay, how it works? The first fit we see before, we distribute this task, then this task, this, this, and this, and each task will be allocated in the processor, in the first processor with a no capacity. So, first we get the task 0 0.3, the first processor will be this, it has a no capacity, 0 0.3. Then we get the task 0 0.5, it fits here, then it will be placed here. Then 0 0.2, then it will be placed here. And now, pay attention, this node is already total overloaded. It, it has a 100% load and all others at the moment are doing nothing. And then we get the next one. The next one will be 0 0.6. Then the next one here, it doesn't fit, then we make it here. And then we get 0 0.7. 0 0.7 doesn't fit here, then we distribute to the other node. And then we get 0 0.1 and then we get it here. And this is the, what we call the first fit. The next case is the best fit. I said before, the bin with the smallest capacity, uh, which can accommodate the item will be allocated. Okay, at the beginning it's the same, the one with the smallest free capacity. 0 0.3, anyone can be, so we take the first one. 0 0.5, the smallest capacity left is here. This had a left capacity from 0 0.8, this had a left capacity from 1 and from 1, so we select the one with the smallest capacity, this will be here. And then 0 0.2, 
and then the smallest capacity will be here. So up to now, it's exactly the same like this. Then we have 0 0.6, it will be activated here. And the next one, 0 0.7, up to now it's the same. And here we see the difference, 0 0.1. And we say it will be allocated with the one with the smallest uh, free capacity. And this had a free capacity of 0 0.4, and this has a capacity of 0 0.3. This is smaller, then the new application will be allocated here. Okay, here we have only a very small difference. Okay, the biggest difference is what we call the worst case. So it's something like load balancing. The one with the biggest free capacity will get the next task. So we get the 0 0.3, it will be allocated here. Then we get 0 0.5, who has the biggest free capacity, this or this. Okay, we allocate this. Then we get 0 0.2, which is the one with the biggest free capacity. This is doing up to now nothing, so it will be allocated here. Then we get 0 0.6. The one with the biggest free capacity is this again. This has 0 0.3, this has 0 0.2 already used, and this has only 0 0.2 used, so it will be allocated here. Then we get 0 0.7. Mm, it fits here, so we will place it here. And 0 0.1, the one with the uh, biggest free capacity will be this, so it will be allocated here. So we can see all of them uh, works, so we were able to allocate all this, but let's consider only these two and see what is better and what is worse. Words matching algorithms. This will be this. This is what we do, something like load balancing, but in this case with memory. What is good? The load in each node is balanced. The node which has more free capacity, this will get the next task. It will not cause the machine to run with high load for a long time, because the machines with the lowest load will get the next job. And it is very good to distribute small tasks. What? It will cause each machine to have a small amount of un un unusable remaining resources. And therefore, it will have a very big fragmentation and the allocation of big tasks may be, may be difficult. This is the case because we are trying to keep all, all, all processors allocated uh, with the same load. So all of them will have small free places. In this case, in the opposite, this will, this will be very hot, uh, very high loaded, and this is total unloaded. But that is something very good, because if we get a very big applications, for example, we, have a, we are at this point, we have this total empty, here 0 0.6, and then we get something with 0 0.8, then we have here no place to fit this. In this case, we have everything fragmented, so we will not be able to allocate this big application. Okay, the opposite with the best matching algorithms, that is best fit, is since the task will be a first in the first machine, the most other machine will have no task. So win machine will have a very big load and all other machines are just doing nothing. So it has a bad uh, load balancing. But it is good for big tasks because the last machines will have nothing. They are idle. So if we get a big task, we will have a machine which is doing nothing and it can handle this big task. So we don't have these fragmentations. And uh, the problem we will have is some machines will be overloaded while others are doing nothing either. And when an overloaded machine fails, we lose a lot of, 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 uh, of, of computation power. Okay. Okay, at the moment, let's continue here. And then the next chapter, we will see other schedule strategies.